Hello, church. We've had quite the journey already. In January and February and March, we looked at the community of God, having a look at what the early church had to do when it entered an unprepared, broken, combative world. That really parallels ours. And that's why the book of Acts is so important. That's why uh, understanding the, the conflicts in the book of Corinth, uh, the Corinthians 1 and 2, it's all very important because this is what happens when you take Jesus into a place that isn't prepared for him. Now, what do we do after Easter? Well, as we've seen in the Community of God series, we have the Holy Spirit with us. The Holy Spirit is not retired. The Holy Spirit did not just inspire the writers of Scripture and then move away somewhere and drop a big black book down among us. Instead, the book we have encourages us to use our imagination and to adjust what we are doing to be able to take the story of Jesus into whatever culture we happen to find ourselves in, whether that is in Tanzania or whether it's in Washington State, whether it's in Mexico or whether it's in Rome, Italy, we have to find a way, not compromising truth, not denying any of the essential truths of Scripture and certainly nothing about uh, the Lordship of Christ, but rather, how can we be wise in explaining what we are and how we do things? Now, this terrifies some people. This terrifies them because for most churches, conformity and turning everything into concrete is the rule. So you don't mess with the worship. You don't mess with the songs. You don't mess with the organization. You don't mess with the way we've always done things. I've lost count of the number of times I've gone to speak at churches, various denominations, and I'll have someone come in and uh, sit down or wave me over, and what they say is not what they really mean. They'll look at me and they'll say something like, my family founded this church. We've been here since it got started. Now, the inner jerk in me wants to say, cool, what was Paul like? But I know what they mean. What they really mean is a power play. We are the ones that are here. We're the ones that started this. You, Patrick, are temporary. You're leaving at the end of the day or at the end of the week. So don't mess up with us. We are in charge here. And nothing changes here. So I hear the power play. I'm not really put off by it. I doubt that that surprises any of you. But I know what the power plays are. And I know how the game is played. And it is totally opposite from Scripture. The idea of a power play, for one, Jesus said that if we want to be big and important, what we have to do is serve and so wash feet and you know, sweep the place and be kind. That's how we get greatness in the Christian economy. But even beyond that, the Bible continually calls us to be creative in the way we think about church. We, every week, we pick up new people, and I'm sure every week, a couple ease away because they, they need something we're not providing for them, and that's absolutely fine. We are not the be-all and the end-all for everybody. In fact, there's no such thing. Once we understand this, then we're ready for what the Bible wants us to sit down and imagine, just brainstorm. You might not even be aware that that's what it was doing, but how many times did Jesus say, the kingdom of heaven is like, and it might be a pearl, might be a coin, might be a lost boy, it might be any of these things, but he's constantly asking you to reimagine what the kingdom is, what our community of faith is, what our church is. Is the church a party? Well, it is in Matthew 22. He says it's very much like a wedding feast. And friends, I, I've been to a lot of weddings. And some of them are a little party-like. Most of them aren't. Uh, but back in this day, there are parties that would go on for days and days and days. And they were massive parties. 
And in many places of the world, it's still like that today. And Jesus says, I want you to imagine the church as a big wedding feast or a big feast given by a rich man for his friends or anything like it. There's so many of these. How about it's like a hospital? Have you ever heard that before? That church is like a hospital? I have actually uh, probably half a dozen times. And I've always smiled and thinking, absolutely. It's not the only thing we're like. But yes, we are a place that takes care of the tender, the broken, the hurt, or we should be, where they can heal. And in fact, some of you have been so damaged by churches or by uh, religious people through your lives that you found this to be truly a safe harbor for you. And I understand that. And in, in that sense, yes, we are a hospital. Like Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, when Jesus said, you know, the healthy don't need the physician, but the sick do. And he's referring to himself as the great physician. It's also like a, a search and rescue team. Think of Luke 15, where you have the prodigal son is what we usually focus on. But the real story is the loving father and the two bad sons. They had both gone different ways to be bad. One gone hyper-religious and judgmental. The other wild and in the world, but it's a loving father that brings them together. It's a search and rescue mission. Others, how about this one? The church should be more like a dream. Now, this one is not quite as obvious, but if you've read the Lord's Prayer, it should be because the Lord's Prayer has a line in there. May thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, that's a very formalized 1611 way of saying a Greek phrase, which can very easily just as well be translated, talking to God, may all your dreams come true through us. What if the church was a dream and we're wanting to fulfill the dream, make God's dream come true? Well, that's one of the ways the Bible says that we can reimagine our church. How about like a revolution? Uh, not with guns and sticks and knives and bombs, but a revolution non nonetheless because the current owner of this world, according to scripture, is Satan. He is the prince of this world. He is the prince of the powers of the air. Jesus launched a revolution, Luke chapter 4, where the devil's trying to get him on his side and Jesus is making him very, very aware that no, that's not going to happen. That instead... Jesus is going to be in opposition. So the church is a revolution. And think about that for a while. Because we truly are. In a world which has thrown away all rules of sexuality. And then tries to confuse gender roles and the like. And then tries to hammer you into silent submission. Make you lose your job. Make you lose your position. Make you lose your friends. If you don't go along with the neo-religions of this world. The neo-religions of this world might appear as science or might appear as cultural pressure. But we are revolutionaries. We don't do that. We love people and we love God and we serve them in the name of Jesus. And we hold to the truth that only one God makes the rules of the universe. And that makes us very much revolutionary. We also could look upon it as a mission. I love the phrase that you find in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus sits down to read at the synagogue and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he lays out his mission, a beautiful mission in Luke chapter four, starting at verse 16. And we'll do a sermon about that later. It's also like a network. You can look at John and Luke in particular because repeatedly in Luke, Jesus is gathering people to sit and eat with that religious people will not eat with. Luke is all about who Jesus ate with. And he carries some of that into the book of Acts as well. But in John also, he gathers people that others would not. And he fellowships with them. But he also gathers people that we know and respect. You know, the apostles, the disciples, the faithful women of the day. And networks with them. So there's not one voice. I was asked recently, as I was out traveling, they said, well, uh, do you have, you know, like an elder board or a... a, a a conference you know, chair and, and such that direct where you guys go. And I said, no, it's actually communitarian. 
emails come in, texts come in, people come to see this soundstage, I go to see where you are, and we listen to each other and we shape our mission accordingly. Everybody has a voice. Well, it's true that you're going to hear my voice more often than any other voice. I hear your voices every day, all day long. I have to silence my phone because since we're around the world, half our church is always awake and that's probably unhealthy so um, for me to you know, pay attention 24-7. But I'm hearing your voices and that absolutely shapes where we're headed. It doesn't shape what we believe about Jesus Christ, but it absolutely shapes the way that we present it. And whether I'm here in Brentwood or whether, you know, it's time for me to fly to Spokane, to Dar es Salaam. It's time for me to go to Mexico. It's time for me to go to Texas, wherever. All of that is part of our reimagining the church. How about we are a pilgrim people like Philippians 2 or like Matthew 28. A people who are pilgrim sent out to do his will. Well, let's do an illustration. <coughs> Excuse me. In John chapter 2, the first mer recorded miracle of Jesus is a very human story. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you might be surprised that Jesus would start his ministry at a party, but that's only because you don't know God that well. He taught honeybees how to dance. He stretched the necks of giraffes. He, um, he painted rainbows on the end of baboons. Um, he had a great time with creativity, and he does expect his children to be creative as well, not fearfully locked into forms inside of walls, but rather be creative about things. And this is going to be quite the party in John chapter 2 when Jesus exchanges many, many gallons, 120 to 180, 160, somewhere in there, gallons of wine, of water rather, for wine. That's a party. Now, I'm not pushing the drinking of alcohol. Um, I have too much in my family history uh, to do anything like that because alcoholism's a you know, favorite indoor sport of some families. So no, that's not it. But the point is this. Is soon, why do I have to even say that? Because we want to protect Christ and not let anything look like it's irreverent. When Jesus was a really interesting guy, and he didn't, as he told us, he said, you know, you, you complain because you play the flute and I don't dance, and you play a dirge and I don't cry. Jesus made his own decision. He expects us to as well. Jesus intended to exchange the weight of religion with all of its regulations for unbridled joy. And he does that here. The water to wine part is not really a biggie. Think about it. You've gone to see a magician and he's done a trick and you go, that was a really amazing trick. And that was a big trick. And so you come back months later, he's touring in an area you find, you go there and he does a much simpler trick and you're going, well, that's not impressive. I thought he'd do a bigger trick. Whenever I tell people that I read the miracle stories and that to me the miracles are the least impressive part of the stories, they can sometimes get offended or think that I am questioning Jesus' ability to do miracles. Not even close. I know he can do miracles. The very God that said, let there be light and there was light, and then we, you, you got us. I mean, that's amazing. And then he turns water to wine. That looks like quite the small trick, miracle. It doesn't seem impressive until you realize what was really going on at that wedding was not about water to wine. It's about something very, very much deeper. He was going to close the gap between God and us like he was going to end the gap and do it in a way that would have rattled cages the rest of his life. People are going to be telling this story and you thought it was just a wedding. John chapter 2. Now there's a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother is there and Jesus and his apostles uh, were also invited. I love the humanity already. It's a beautiful human story. We have 
Mary, who is there. And women are there at weddings. They are tuned in. They will even quiz their husbands on the way home about shoes and decor, no matter how many times their husbands let them down by not noticing any of that. They are still involved. And the guys are just there, hoping there's cake and that the reception doesn't take too long with the endless parade of pictures and such, then they can you know, get home and watch the game later. But there they are. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother came to Jesus and said, they have no more wine. Now, I love this because I used to teach a whole semester on male and female communication. And yeah, we do process information in a totally different way. And we express what we've processed a different way, but we think the other person should get it. Just amazing to me how we never seem to understand that we're going to need a different language if we're doing cross-sexual boundary communication. Think of it this way. Mary says they have no more wine. Had this Jesus just been a guy, he would have said, bummer, that really brings a party down. Let's you know, tell Habib to bring the camel around and we're out of here. But Jesus is the maker of women. He's the creator of woman. He knows what she really means is, would you please right now go take care of this situation because I know you can. She didn't say that. She thinks she said that. Now this story never happened, but I use this illustration all the time because it's just a, an easy one that's relatable. Let's say that uh, Miss Cammie and I are driving along and Miss Cammie goes, you know, Patrick, would you like to have some ice cream? And I think about it for a while and I go, you know, not really. And then I drive home. I'm in trouble. We all know I'm in trouble. But men won't know why they're in trouble for some time. They just know that the wife is making a lot of noise moving around the house, slamming things, and that every time you ask them, is everything okay? They'll say, it's fine, it's fine. What could be right? Everything is fine, which means DEFCON 4. And yet, we're not allowed to know why. And then one day when you're laying in bed, and you, you open up your eyes there in the hospital, and her hand's hovering over the life support system plug, and you ask why, she'll look at you and say, you didn't get me ice cream when I wanted it. <laughs> you should have said you wanted it. Well, Mary thinks she told Jesus to do something, but she didn't. Jesus, however, is very wise here, and he says, woman, by the way, that was not like today. If I were to look at Cam and go, woman, that's looked upon as a negative. And I'm not sure how it got there, but it's absolutely there. This is more like, it's a very great term of respect, endearment. You know, more like dear lady, esteemed lady, all right? He says, I'm not ready to get this started publicly. Next scene, <clears throat> really, next line. Mary goes to the servants and she says, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And you can almost see Jesus going, Phew. let's review. <clears throat> Mary didn't ask him to do anything, but she thought that she did. Jesus, knowing that, said no. She thought that meant yes and prepared for his response. Does this seem familiar to any guy out there? It should, yes. Don't nod. Don't nod if it's going to get you harmed. You stay safe, people. But most of us know that's the way this works. So, what happens next? Well, something weird, actually. Look at verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. It's a lot. That's a lot. Now, if you don't know what these are, this is the thing. They have no place in this story. None. Because this has nothing to do with water you would drink, nothing to do with wine. In fact, these jars would be separate and almost certainly well outside at a distance from everything else. Why? Well, they had a religious ritual that was a tradition. It was not required by God. But you would go and you'd wash your hands and yes, probably had its roots in hygiene somewhere, but they didn't understand germs and such. They were just rinsing off visible dirt. 
But as they did so, as they'd raise one arm, uh, as the water rolls off this elbow, they'd say one prayer. And then they'd do, and as the water runs off this elbow, another prayer. Nothing wrong with that. That's, this water is unclean. If it splashes on you, you got to go change because that's unclean. Read Leviticus starting at chapter 11 and forward. Very strict rules about all of this. So that's over there. Why are we talking about this? This is like see, you know, watching a great chase scene, like in a, the great Steve McQueen uh, movie, Bullet, from way back in the day. And uh, before, every car had to turn flips, hit a fruit stand, and explode. You know, they were real car chases back then. And then cut right in the middle of it, and all of a sudden you're looking at Africa, and the announcer talks about how many kits a Mercat has every year. And you're going, What? Because we should be cutting over here to the wine bags or the amphorae if they were stone jars. And Jesus wouldn't have even had to look that direction. He could have been very subtle and just gone, <laughs> not even wiggling the eyebrows, just, I don't have eyebrows, but uh, now some of you are, rec are sitting, noticing that for the first time. Um, he didn't have to do any of that. They could have, and filled up. But no, if he's going to start doing his mission, he looks over there. Because this is a visible representation of all of the rules people had accepted when their religious leaders keep pouring these rules on them. And you must do this to be pleasing to God and to our holy society. And he looks over there. He says, fill those with water. Now, this is a shocker. And the, the next line, they filled them to the brim. You never, never, never filled them to the brim. Why? Because of splashage. You needed to be able to drip that stuff down in, not pull it out and splash around, because once again, unclean. He is forcing an issue. What in the world is going on here? Well, we're about to find out. Then he tells them, the caterers, take a cup out and take it to the master of the banquet. In every Jesus story, there comes a point where I sit back and go, would I have done that? And almost always the answer is no. When I was a boy, sometimes our Bible class teachers or our preachers made it act like the, the apostles were stupid and slow. They didn't get it. Well, come on, people. They hadn't had 2,000 years of vacation Bible school, Sunday morning Bible classes, and, uh, I don't know, veggie tales back in the day on telly. They didn't have any of that. They were super fast on the uptake compared to any of us and braver than almost anybody I can imagine. But this would have been one of those, what? And it was before he'd really started gathering people. What is Jesus doing here? It's not water to wine. That's not the kicker. Or he would have used the other stuff, the amphorae, the leather wineskins. He didn't use those. He pointed over to the thing that represented one of the hundreds of traditions they had piled upon people that they had to fulfill or they weren't God's people. Do you remember even later on? as Jesus' people are going through a field and gleaning, which is absolutely legal, uh, where you're, you're walking through and you grab and you eat from the field as you're going through. Uh, again, read Leviticus and Deuteronomy. God made that legal. Yet they were criticized. The Pharisees go, wait, wait. How come they're eating without washing their hands? And they didn't mean for hygiene. They meant following the traditions of our fathers. And Jesus elsewhere even warns them, you've made God... And following God into nothing more than man's rules. And you've made it empty. You've made it vain, of no use. That's a big statement. Well, he's nothing if not consistent. Because how he starts is at this wedding, looking over at those jars and says, let's start this. Now, why did they fill them to the brim? The Bible doesn't say. But I can only think of one reason, and that is Mary. Mary was a formidable woman. I know whenever you see the pictures of her, she's always white, which she wasn't. And she's always wearing this little, like, pale blue with the white headband here. 
and either holding the dying Christ or the baby. Um, and sometimes, you know, maybe with her hand out in the heart, if, you're, uh, if you've got a Catholic card, a devotional card, uh, uh, or a painting like that on the, on, on the wall. Please understand, we don't even know where Joseph is. Joseph's gone. Uh, did he die? Maybe. Did he leave her? Absolutely legal. Because he was Sadiq. He was a righteous man, the Bible says. If later on he doubted her story about being pregnant without ever having sexual relations, he was given every right to leave, almost an obligation, to leave her and go start another family. We don't know what happened to Joseph. We don't even have early traditions about Joseph. All of our traditions even are late, which makes them unreliable, and we have zero history. But we do know that Mary's other sons did not believe her story. Think about that. Think about the weight of that for a moment. Her own sons thought she was an adulteress. Well, if they thought that, so did the women in the village. Mary would have had to go gather water on her own. She would have had to go and argue and negotiate for bread on her own. She would have been a thrown away woman that was looked down upon all of her life. And in fact, there were many times in scriptures, well, several times in scripture, where people walk up to Jesus and a couple times Mary's there. And they look at him and they go, we know who our father was. Kind of explains why Jesus treated women the way he did. Why he sought out the ones that nobody else would fellowship with and took care of them. But moving on. I bet Mary was a tough woman. Made tough by all of this. And I bet she stared at them until they filled up that to the brim. Then he said, take it out. Take it to, to the master of the banquet. Would I have done that? No, no. Because my entire... <laughs> I'll never get more than 20 miles away from where I'm, I was born. That's kind of the range back then. And if I lose my business because I took bath water to, out of dirty jars to the master of the banquet, I'm out of a job. My kids won't eat. This is horrible. But they did it. The master of the banquet took a sip. The Bible says he didn't know where it'd come from. The Bible didn't even have to tell me that. He took a sip, which meant he had no idea where it came from. I've been in people's houses before where they've got little toddlers who are very sweet, and they'll come over with a little plastic cup of water. He goes, you want some water? And I'll take it, and I'll be thinking, what water source are they high enough to reach? And you start looking for a plant or doing that whole, mm -hmm, you know, the parents tend to do. What's going on here? Fear. Because now the master of the banquet calls the caterers over. If that was you, your heart would be sunk. Your belly would be upset. You'd be going, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. And he goes, why'd you keep the best stuff for last? It doesn't make any sense. By the way, it's, this is also how you can prove it's not grape juice, which some people try to do. It is wine. The word means wine. This is what they did. If you put in grape juice, you would then have the master of the banquet be saying, everybody puts out the best grape juice first and then when everybody is completely graped then they bring out the cheaper grape juice it just doesn't make sense and he's going why'd you keep the best for last and then the bible says it was through this that jesus showed his glory water to wine gotta tell you not that impressive not that impressive it's a miracle got it i can't do it you can't do it nobody we know can do it he can do it but he also created the entire universe so water to wine that's not what showed his glory. What showed his glory was Jesus looked at that 600 plus rules that people were, gathered, were just piled on their shoulders. And he said, enough. Done. And he turned the water of washing, tradition, dirt, obligation into the wine of great joy at a party. He didn't dance to their tune. Luke chapter 7, verse 30. He didn't, he, he didn't come among us as a, I will be very careful not to upset anybody. No. He came at a party and said, we're dropping those rules. In fact, do you remember the, the Sermon on the Mount? What does he say? What does he say five times? You have heard it said, and he quotes scripture. And he goes, but I say to you, 
you remember the transfiguration? There are the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah. And everybody's getting all excited. And God breaks in and goes, this is my beloved son. You listen to him. We've got to get our heads around this. The Bible brings us to Jesus. But Jesus doesn't just throw us back into the Bible and walk away. We walk with Jesus and we reimagine what all this is going to be. When you were little, if you did church, uh, when you were little, you probably did something such as, this is the church and here is the steeple or here is the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. Well, that's a pretty small church. There's not much of a congregation there. If it's a house church, that would be pretty good. Why aren't more people coming to Christ? Maybe because they didn't get an invitation to a party. They were given an invitation to something that was full of rules where they're going to feel uncomfortable. My wife did design for many, many years and still does some from time to time. And every now and then the designers would have this big do. I've watched people applaud a refrigerator. And she'll ask me to go with her and um, sometimes it is formal dress, and so you get all that in. Other times it'll be like white coat and tails. I'm going, nope, out, not doing that, too far. Maybe the reason why our churches are so small is because people don't realize it's a party. They think it's all about washing in the dirty water. They think it's all about the obligations, the rules, the traditions. Don't offend anybody. Don't push any boundaries. When Jesus was the greatest boundary pusher, breaker, and ignorer of all history. How about imagining church as a party? Joy. Peace. Enjoying each other and welcoming anyone else in. This isn't irreverent. This is following our Lord. We're going to talk more about this next week and in the weeks to come. But in the meantime, go back especially to the first of this lesson. Get the notes that are in the, um, in the description box. And let's start reimagining what church would look like where you are among the kind of people you know well. We can do this with God. We have permission. We'll see you next week.